So it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce our lecture speakers this evening, which I don't normally get to do, so this is very exciting. Uh, much like last week's lecture, tonight we are joined by some amazing, helpful humans. Fixing the mistakes of past generations is no easy task. Whether right whales, puffins, or other species, there are some wonderful people around the globe doing great work to ensure future generations don't miss the wonderful biodiversity that takes place on planet Earth. So joining us tonight, we have Stephen W. Kress, Vice President for Bird Conservation for the National Audubon Society and Director of the Society's Maine Coast Seabird Sanctuaries. Also joining us tonight as the co-author of Project Puffin is Derek Z. Jackson, a Boston column uh, columnist since 1988, and he was also a 2001 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Commentary. He is a nine-time winner of Journalism Awards from the National Association of Black Journalists, a two-time winner for Commentary from the National Education Writers Association, a 2012 finalist from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists, and the 2004 winner for Commentary on Gay Marriage from the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association. I'm particularly honored and actually quite humbled to be here this evening uh, as the co-author of Project Puffin because in 1973 uh, when Steve officially launched his project I was a mere sophomore in college at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee a sports writer uh, covering high school sports for the Milwaukee Journal. Uh, it, if I stretch the truth a bit um, I can honestly tell you that I've been a bird watcher all my life, except that the birds on my life list were the Atlanta Hawks, the St. Louis Cardinals, the Philadelphia Eagles, and the Baltimore Orioles. In fact, the most important bird on my life list at that time was the left-handed, green-chested, green-shorted Larry Bird, a migrant from Indiana who began nesting at a garden in Boston uh, who was considered quite an aggressive invasive species in Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and New York to Lakers, 76ers, and Knicks fans. In fact, I wouldn't even know anything about birds at all except that I met an outdoors woman uh, in those days, Michelle Holmes, uh, who is here this evening. So Michelle, could you wave? And she is, she is uh, completely responsible for me caring about such critters as puffins. And um, I'm actually chosen to uh, make my remarks through uh, the following t uh, slideshow um, in which I hope to uh, give you a sense, uh, my sense of the project, as well as the future challenges for what this bird means and uh, what it now has come to symbolize 40 years, uh, more than 40 years after Steve started his project. And I want to um, make sure that you know that this slideshow was produced with the help uh, of one of the Eagle Scouts in the troop in Cambridge, Massachusetts that my wife and I volunteer for. Uh, Co-ed, I, sh I should just very clearly say, because I know Scouts sets off alarm bells for some people. Um, we're a co-ed inclusive troop, uh, including a gay, and, uh, gay and lesbian parents and kids. So um, uh, this was produced with the help of Miles Thomas Moore. I know he was trying to get here from uh, New York. Um, and there he is, uh, stand up, Miles. Mm. All right, so with no further um, delay, uh, could you please play the slideshow. While working with Steve Kress on the book Project Puffin, my wife and medical researcher Michelle Holmes asked us, now don't get me wrong, putting the puffins back is a phenomenal accomplishment, but 
If interns have to stay every summer on Eastern Egg Rock, how is it a sustainable project? That is an important question. Cress began the project in 1973 by bringing little chicks down from Newfoundland, raising them in handmade burrows, and watching them bounce into the ocean on the unproven lark that the birds would remember Eastern Egg Rock, a tiny seven-acre jumble of rocks in Muscongas Bay, as their native home. He conceived of the project amid the backdrop of the first Earth Days, the expansion of the Clean Air Act, the creation of the Clean Water Act, and the federal banning of the pesticide DDT, which wreaked havoc on the entire ecosystem, and most famously among birds, the bald eagles, osprey, and peregrine falcons. Back then, there was still much talk about restoring the so-called balance of nature. Steve himself thought a sustainable project meant getting puffins in Maine back to a population where it could survive on its own as it did before European settlement. Four decades later, it is clear that can never happen. And that begs the question, is there any lasting importance in a project where, if it ever stopped, great blackback gulls and herring gulls and bald eagles would come back and wipe everything out? The answer is yes. The project began as an unprecedented attempt to restore a colorful and charismatic seabird to an island nearly a century after humans hunted them into local extinction. Today, the Atlantic puffin is a living definition of modern stewardship. And we need that stewardship more than ever. The threats that affect birds such as puffins are far greater today than the bullets of gunners of the late 1800s. Humans have so altered the landscape and the oceans that a small island such as Eastern Egg cannot escape the effects of humanity even in sparsely populated Maine. Egg Rock is an island connected to the mainland, not by a bridge, of course, but by a web of creatures from plankton to predator and from garbage landfills to the fishing waste of passing lobster boats. These support huge numbers of gulls, and each gull is always looking for the next meal, and those meals do include puffins. Also, the very success of other coastal conservation efforts over the past century have nurtured other voracious threats to the puffin, such as bald eagles, owls, mink, and river otters. None of them find the six miles between Eastern Egg and the mainland any obstacle to dinner. The puffins now also stand for something else that Crest did not originally consider. From the U.S. to the U.K., and from Canada to even Iceland, where puffins still number in the millions, the bird is now a canary of climate change and a sentinel warning us of how we are dramatically overfishing our oceans for the very forage fish seabirds eat. You might say that forage fish, like the herring that puffins like to eat, are the ethanol of the sea. Where the vast majority of corn grown in the United States today is for fuel, 90% of forage fish catch ends up at fish farms and pig and poultry feed. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, which funded research by scientists at the University of British Columbia, the world's pigs and poultry now eat six times more fish than Americans. How fast could a seabird population collapse from these modern threats? One dramatic example is the African penguin. There were likely one and a half million to three million African penguins in the early 20th century off the coast of South Africa and Namibia. But by 2009, the population had crashed to just 26,000 breeding pairs and is now listed as endangered because of commercial fishing, oil pollution, and warming waters that drive their anchovies and sardines too far away to feed on. Can the Atlantic puffin suffer such a similar fate? The birds that Crest restored 
may be the first of the species to answer that question. On the surface, all may seem well, because in the summer of 2014, Project Puffin set a new record of 148 pairs of breeding puffins on Eastern Egg. And when there were only a few dozen puffins on just one island in Maine at the start of the project, which was Matinica's Rock, there are now more than 1,000 breeding pairs of puffins on four islands. But the puffins of Maine are at the absolute southernmost end of their known breeding range in North America. And the last few years have brought dramatically variating water temperatures, including the warmest waters ever recorded in the Gulf of Maine in 2012. In Europe, warmer waters are already being linked to less food and less reproduction for puffins in Norway, Scotland, and southern Iceland. In New England, warmer waters are already resulting in dramatic shifts of some underwater creatures. Lobsters, as a species, have moved more than 40 miles north in the last decade. The kinds of fish puffins have been bringing ashore in recent years to feed their chicks has also changed dramatically with more and more species more associated with mid-Atlantic waters. The good news is that Canadian and Maine puffins are amazingly adaptable to catching whatever is available. One researcher in New Brunswick discovered 51 species of marine life in the feces of puffins. But the concern is that while some species are edible, nutritious, and the right shape for chicks, other species are not. And the unknown question is what will be available in the coming decades. Perhaps the biggest lesson Crest learned from Project Puffin is that there actually is no such thing as balance. John Critcher, author of the 2009 book, The Balance of Nature, The Enduring Myth, wrote, the balance of nature, whatever it is, and whatever it will become, is our choice, and I would argue, our moral responsibility. Or, as Canadian seabird researcher Tony Diamond told me in 1986 when I did my first story on Project Puffin, it's time somebody played God after our predecessors played the devil for so long. One of Cress's top mentors, the late ecologist Bill Drury, seconded that notion by saying, if we don't play God, the gulls will. To play someone other than the devil will require utmost vigilance. In 1973, Crest set out to restore just one bird with a handful of people. But in the process, he learned that an entire ecosystem also had to be restored and protected, especially turn populations whose screeching and dive bombing provide cover for puffins. Since its beginning, the project has been maintained with the aid of more than 500 college and graduate school interns. They represent a special ecosystem in and of themselves. Like Cress himself, who grew up chasing lizards in suburban Columbus, Ohio, many of the interns grew up chasing lizards, raising ducks, building houses for worms and newts, and even reassembling porcupine skeletons. In 2009, I asked the crew of Eastern Egg Rock what they also remembered about their childhoods that helped them appreciate nature enough to relish working on isolated islands to support seabirds. With almost no hesitation, one said, we didn't watch TV. Another one said, hmm, we didn't have TV either. A third said, well, we had TV, but no video games. This is blasphemy in mainstream culture, yet these interns represent the cutting edge of what many experts realize we need today in a world where a disturbing percentage of people are disconnected from the natural world. Here, preserving the puffin, are young adults who as children were able to play outdoors and explore on their own without the fear of getting muddy, 
while putting their hands on frogs, salamanders, and other small creatures, or even playing hide and seek in cemeteries. Thus today, the puffins and the young people who have taken care of them represent something much more important than the mere opportunity for you and me to view a beautiful bird. Many of the interns of yesteryear have gone on to run zoos, direct state and provincial wildlife programs, and help skyscraper builders and wind turbine developers avoid killing birds. The techniques used on Eastern Egg, including the translocation of chicks and decoys, have now been used to bring back or relocate nearly 50 species of seabirds in 14 countries. This is how Project Puffin to answer my wife's original question, is indeed a sustainable project. By spreading hope for the preservation of seabirds well beyond the restoration of one bird and sending forth into the world a new generation of conservationists. The return of the puffin to seven acres of jumbled rocks off the coast of Maine should inspire all of us to look at other places where species have been lost and vow to return them. The puffin represents a touchstone of what can happen when we dare to try. This is Derek Jackson for Project Puffin. <laughs>
because we wouldn't want to come up with too accurate of a decoy that would actually accept the food. We only want to turn to the lamb and hopefully find a more receptive mate. This poor frustrated male turn is trying to mount this decoy. Uh, this is a relationship that just won't get off the ground, literally, in any, any conceivable way. I, I began wondering what it is about decoys that is so attractive, and so we, we tested a variety of things, including this essence of churn decoy. <laughs> this is a, just a piece of two by four taper on one end with a dowel rod and a beak on top. And yet even that is attractive to turns. In their world, there's nothing like that. And so it, it has just the kind of the basic um, you know, core attraction. Of course, they soon figure out it's not the real thing. But they do find mates, and they do nest usually within inches of decoys. This method now has a name. It's probably our most successful method called social attraction. We've talked a, a few times about projects around the world, and I'm going to give you a few examples of how this works. One of the challenges that I faced when I started this project was the criticism that why spend even a dollar on a bird that is still numbering in the millions in Iceland, and that was the puffins. Even though they were gone from Maine, and they, and they were gone because we know that people killed them in nets. Why spend money when other birds are endangered? And I argued that if we could do it for puffins and demonstrate that they were, would come back, other birds could benefit. The rosy tern was our first success. This is an endangered species. Less than 200 pairs nest in the state of Maine. Uh, only a few thousand pairs nest anywhere in the United States. And they came when the common and arctic terns came back. But so many terns have come back that I had no idea that that in itself would be a problem. Now this may not look particularly significant, some green vegetation with a few bird droppings on it. But if you've got 7,000 seabirds nesting on three or four acres of habitat, the guano adds up. It becomes very significant. And a trend which, certainly living in Boston, you're well aware of, is that we're getting more and more precipitation in the Northeast. It's a, it's a predicted climate effect. You saw it in the winter with the snow. Perhaps you've noticed in the summers they're wetter than they used to be. And that combination of all that guano from all those restored turns combined with the rain is just a, a, a weeds paradise. And the vegetation is growing fast, especially, especially plants that, um, from other countries and even native plants. And too much of, of a cover is not a good thing for turns. These baby common turns need a combination of open space and places to hide from predators. But when the vegetation spills out over the rocks, there's no place to hide, then the chicks uh, are stranded inside this sea, this wall of vegetation. So what I'm saying is that we learned how to bring the terns back, but by bringing back thousands of them, that rain of guano washed into the roots by the rain of, of climate change is causing a huge effect. These are new problems. Bringing birds back to one spot is not the end of the management not the end of the stewardship, because it often leads to new problems and perhaps new solutions, too. These are uh, participants from the Hog Island Audubon camp helping us now to create new habitat using outdoor carpets that we put down in place, testing new solutions, trying to hold the status quo, trying to be stewards of a wildlife. That carpet technique has proved very helpful, by the way. It, it smothers, if you're a gardener, you know about landscape fabric, and it's sort of like that, but in a heavier duty way. The invasive musters uh, can't get over everything, and the terns are very happy. You can see the big smile on this endangered roseate tern. They wouldn't be there without us. Today, 100% of Maine's roseate terns nest on the seven islands that we manage for Project Puffin. And one of the things that we begin to realize is that just managing an island is not enough. Turns are connected to the world. We begin putting those little devices on the leg bands of turns. That little, that little box is a geolocator. It measures the length of the day. It measures the time of the year. And that's all you need to begin to understand where turns go. This is an amazing map of the planet. 
and it shows eastern egg rock there off the main coast and where uh, five terns went, each a different, shown here a different color. They all fly out to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, then they find their way south across the relatively sterile waters of the equator, and then all the way down to Antarctica where they spend the winter before coming home again in the spring, over 40,000 miles, some of them wandering all the way to the Indian Ocean before they come back to the main coast. Next year, the same birds do a similar pattern every year, and they may live to be 30 years. These methods that we've developed in Maine, has been said a couple of times previously tonight, have been used elsewhere. Here are some of the places that they're used, and, and we don't have the time to get into the details of just uh, what all these projects are, but I want to show you a few of them. Uh, off the coast of California is a project that I'm quite proud of, and this is a, a, a sea stack just south of San Francisco called Devil's Slide Rock. It's named for the road there that tends to slide into the ocean, and there's a sea stack, a chunk of rock, where common murs nested, and here they are crowded on top of Devil's Slide Rock. There were about 2,300 pairs of them nesting there until about 1978. And then oil spills started to happen, and by 1980 they were gone, completely gone. Most had been killed in the oil spills along with MERS and other kinds of birds. I was asked after several years if it was possible to use social attraction here. And I flew out to California sort of accustomed to what I thought were rough landings on islands off the main coast, and I saw the not-so-peaceful Pacific gnawing away a double slide rock on a calm day. You can see the black zone is where the water sprays. The birds are nest only on the top. And I was asked if we could use decoys here, and, and uh, it didn't look like a good spot to land. And that's when I discovered that we can have to adapt these methods in different ways and have, find different skill sets. Fortunately, in California, there are a lot of mountain climbing people. <laughs> and so there's some wild cowboy-like Zodiac riders who manage to, to take their Zodiac rubber boats right up to the edge. Mountain climbers leaped out, climbed up this cliff, and put up 400 decoys on top of that rock. They also carried up car batteries. Yes, car batteries, solar panels, boxes with mirrors on them fake eggs, fake chicks, they were all set up on top. And the critics, there are always critics for these projects, said it's a waste of time, they'll never come. They've been gone for 10 years, they'll never come back. But I was so happy to show those critics the first egg that was laid within days of putting up the decoys. It turns out the MERS were just waiting for other MERS. And once we put up the decoys, they landed and they found each other and they laid an egg, and here's a map, here's a photo of what this rock looked like uh, in 1979, before the oil spill, and here it is, after restoration, those are all live MERS. There's as many MERS on Devil's Slide Rock now as there was before. On this island, the decoys are gone. This island is closer to a self-sustaining population, of course, until the next oil spill. So we're hoping there won't be one, but at least now we know the methods, we know what's involved with restoration. It's not easy, it takes time, it takes patience, it takes risk. They're sometimes called golden goonies, one of the most beautiful seabirds of the world, the short-tailed albatross with that bubblegum pink beak with a blue tip. Millions of them once nested on islands off the coast of Japan, the South Sea of Japan. They flew north to Alaska, they flew south along the California coast and back to Japan. Six million of them had that migration pattern. Almost all of them were killed by the early 1900s to turn into mattresses, slaughtered, plucked, dead. Fortunately, a few pairs survived at sea and they were rediscovered nesting on one of the Japanese nesting islands called Torashima Island, means bird island. They nested on this island on the very top of the most exposed, difficult place to climb to, safe from, I guess, the plume hunters. 
The problem is that Torashima is an active volcano, and if it erupts, the last of them will be snuffed out. If they didn't ki weren't killed by hunters, they'll be killed by a volcano. So what to do? Fortunately, uh, a, a Japanese biologist heard what we were doing in Maine and has applied the technique in a masterful way. He's moved decoy making to a new level. In fact, he hired the most famous decoy carver in Japan who carved lifelike models who were then replicated and hand painted, complete with glass eyes and detailed feathers, webbed feet with scales on the feet, and they set out the best in Sony sound systems. And they broadcast that with huge speakers out to sea, and the albatross came. And they also have been moving, they, they put that on, a, on, a, on an island without um, volcanoes. And they also, to make sure that this process worked, have helicoptered off baby uh, albatross chicks off of the volcano to the non-volcanic island. And this is a baby bird. Look how it takes two people to give it a fish. But with enough help and enough fish and enough determination, uh, this project is working. And now some of the albatross are coming back to the non-volcanic island. Also in Asia, another project that is that has uh, been inspired by Project Puffin uh, is the work with the Chinese crested tern. This is probably the rarest seabird in the world. Only 50 of these orange-beaked, black-tipped birds live in the world. They too were thought to be extinct, but then a few were found. And the problem here is that people in China hunt the eggs, and they take the eggs, and they land on the tern nesting islands. And these uh, rare terns nest with the greater crested terns, and people land, and they take the eggs, and the bird was, is highly threatened by this. What it needed is safe nesting places. Fortunately, there are Chinese uh, biologists now using social attraction, the decoy method, and you can see these two biologists walking through uh, decoys, um, and others are putting up solar panels, and they're playing their recordings of, of Chinese crested terns. If you look carefully, you see that this turn is on a block, and behind it, there are other turns. It's not so obvious, but um, watch what's going on here. <laughs> And watch that Chinese crested churn leap up on the back of that decoy. <laughs> Slips off. It's a slippery slope. <laughs> Notice that there's another Chinese crested churn right there who is approaching. And eventually they do get together. So it has a, it has a happy ending. <laughs> now back at Eastern Egg Rock, um, our interns spend about six hours every day sitting in these little plywood uh, boxes. I don't tell them they're like phone booths because they're too young to know what a phone booth is, my, my interns. But they sit in these boxes that are like three feet square, and they wait there very patiently to see what uh, they can see. They have to stay out there because if they weren't there, the gulls and the eagles would take over. But they see that the puffins are back, and the puffin numbers have been increasing. And this graph simply shows that. It doesn't show that for eight years we were waiting to get the first puffins <coughs> back here on Seal Island. Now there are about 500 pairs in Eastern Egg Rock. There are 148 pairs. This little dip in the, um, in the graph is interesting. Um, last two years, 12, 2012 and 13, because that is the ocean heat wave that that you heard about before, the warmest waters in the history of the Gulf of Maine that we've documented, at least in the last 150 years. Puffins don't like warm weather. Remember, we are at the southern limit of their range. A lot of warm weather won't be good for puffins. We know that. Puffins don't breed when the water is too warm. They don't find the kinds of fish that they like. They like a little white hake as their favorite food. It'll turn into a big cod-like fish eventually. And last summer we documented by sitting in those bird blinds from early dawn to dark. It takes about 2,500 little fish to raise one puffin chick, mostly white hake. On a good day they'll bring in Atlantic herring, much bigger than hake, thicker, a better choice. Those two fish make up most of the diet. <coughs> it's not a good day when the puffins bring back butterfish. Here's a 
Here's a video of a little puffin in a burrow with a camera inside the burrow. Notice the parent is sitting in the entrance way. It did its job. It brought back a nice big fish. It probably thought it was doing a good thing. But the fish, unfortunately, is a species that the puffin can't swallow because although it's the right length, it's not the right width. Who would guess that a fish could be the wrong width to swallow? These butterfish are southern fish, and as the water warms, they're finding their way up into the Gulf of Maine. And the hake and the herring are moving to deeper waters to stay cool. We've tracked the numbers of these each year and seen that since about 2009, uh, there's been a trend in seeing more butterfish than in previous years. But what are we going to do about those gulls in the long run? Where's, the, where's the, this project going? What if we were to leave? What would happen? I can tell you that the gulls would be right back. And every year, when we board up the Egg Rock Hilton at the end of the year, and we secure it for the winter, the day we leave, tour boats go by, and they tell me that there's bald eagles sitting on the roof. The eagles were just watching with their eagle eyes for us to leave. And then they fly out and they eat whatever birds they can find on the island. We know that if we weren't there, <coughs> these predators would be there. It's not about balance, it's about survival. That eagle is just looking for another meal. It's no great plan. He's just looking for his next meal, and he'll find it. So we have discovered that by putting out the young biologists, those dedicated young people that Derek referred to, early in the spring in May, the eagles won't come. The eagles are wary, and so are the gulls. And if the gulls do lay eggs, we, we have a permit to take them away. But if we weren't there, I can assure you, those gulls wouldn't read the sign and obey the rules. <laughs> Neither would the eagles. So I had this great idea one year. I, I, I contracted with a Cornell engineer to help me build a robot. And the robot was to sleep in the box, and he was to pop up out of the box randomly. Solar powered, I thought I was so smart. And I dressed them up like my interns, and the interns actually walked around and, and occasionally shot a gun off, and we thought we would transfer that learning from the intern to the, to the robot, but the robot rusted up and didn't slept in too much. And eventually we propped him up, and he became just a big gull perch. I don't think the answer is in robots. Never under, underestimate the intelligence of a bird. The future is in the biologists. It's not about having to sort of bolster up this colony. It's about training future conservation biologists that, that get it that care. They're willing to be dedicated. Who are these people? Yes, they probably were the lizard chasers as children, the frog catchers, the bird watchers, and as young biologists. They're out there with the birds, not going to town on the weekends. They go out for the whole summer and live on these little rocky islands. They're out there because they care. They want to make a difference. How do we find people to do this? How do we educate them? Hog Island is what attracted me to Maine. This is the beautiful place, a stunningly uh, spectacular location, where people of all ages come to learn about birds. Not everybody is going to be out there as an intern, but people, and perhaps there are people in this room that would like to spend six days on an island, uh, not in a tent, not in an egg rock hilt, in fairly comfortable accommodations, learning about birds. Another way to do it is to go on the puffin tours that circle egg rock. Every day, several thousand people over the course of the summer see the birds and learn about them. And they're building an economy around this in Maine. And if that's too much, turn on to the Puffin Cam. Eight million uh, visitors last year, all around the world, 218 countries were watching the, the Puffins in Maine. Who are these people and do they care? Well, I hope so. We don't know. But it's a first step. It's a way to connect with nature. They, if they support this work through financial gifts, if they adopt a puffin, which I hope they will, or if they vote for people that can create policy to protect the environment and protect the forage fish that seabirds need, then there's a chance that the puffins will survive. 
these young biologists that are now have the future of puffins literally in their hands are the best future, the best insurance that life will continue on this planet. If we lose it in our generation, the next generation won't have a chance. And that's what Project Puffin is all about. Now, I do want to share just a little bit of this book. I don't do this very often, to read a book to people. But when I give these talks, and I've given these talks like this for many years, I have, um, I don't usually get to tell what kinds of things can sometimes happen. And so I want to share with you one, a little backstory to, to this. Because the book has given me a chance to reflect on the history of the project. And it isn't all, it isn't all great success. We have had lots of ups and downs. And one of those ups and downs happened in 1989. Um, I'm going to just read some of this because I think this speaks to sort of the, what really is behind a project like this. I was pleased when Mike Mayo and Judy Fife contacted me in 1989 to tell me about a new hour-long documentary they were producing on Roger Tory Peterson titled Celebration of Birds for the well-known PBS series Nature. They started filming at the Ding Darling Refuge in Florida, a great spot. If you've never been there, I encourage you to go there. And they worked their way up the Atlantic coast with Roger, revisiting places that he'd been to in the past. They went to Delaware Bay, where they recounted the saga of the red knots and the horseshoe crabs. They traveled to Roger's hometown in Old Lyme, Connecticut, where he narrated the demise and the recovery of ospreys following the banning of DDT. They wanted to bring him to Maine by late July, where they would film Peterson's return to Eastern Egg Rock, where he had brought Hog Island campers on field trips more than 50 years earlier. The idea was to show the possibilities of seabird restoration and the progress we had achieved. At 81 years of age and recovering from prostate surgery, Roger seemed frail. Our paths had crossed many times over the years since Irv Kasoy first introduced us in Columbus. Now he was decorated by presidents and widely recognized as the father of modern bird watching. He walked with the aid of a monopod, which he gave me pause as I considered the slippery landings in irregular terrain at Egg Rock. But he was undaunted by the less than ideal weather and the thick fog that greeted him at the top of the hill looking over Muscongas Bay. On Tuesday, July 24th, the fog cleared, and we moved forward with the plan to take Roger, Mike, and Judy to Eastern Egg Rock aboard my 23-foot seaway, the Linda 3. But the CB radio report from Barbara North, the island supervisor, told us that sea swells were high and the landing was problematic. While making arrangements for the landing, I remembered what Roger's wife, Ginny, had said to me. Take care of Roger. He is a national treasure. With the help of the landings, I arranged for Joe Johansson to join us so that Joe could row Roger ashore in his 21-foot wooden dory, along with Mike and Judy's equipment, which included a $50,000 camera. <laughs> After tents were up, Mike and Judy filmed an interview between Roger and me. I headed back to the mainland to resume my responsibilities at Hog Island, leaving Roger to row among the seabirds and entertain Barbara and the others with stories of birding. Two days later, I went back to the island to retrieve Roger, Mike and Judy, for a celebrity evening on Hog Island. We were joined by Jerry Skinner, a marine instructor on Hog Island, and Captain Bob Bowman, a noted Bar Harbor whale researcher who happened to be visiting. Everyone wanted a chance to spend a little time with Roger. Ever since Marlon Perkins had refused to be photographed, in what we call the geezer, our orange sport yak, we had switched to using rubber inflatables. And now we were going to count on that inflatable to carry Roger and all his gear from Egg Rock out to the Lunda. 
Roger made it into the boat without much difficulty. The sea was calm and we didn't bother with life jackets. On the way back to Hog Island, we detoured three miles to the west to circle western Agrock, the treeless 10-acre island that I had scouted for puffin nesting habitat two decades earlier. I had not visited it in many years, but I thought that western egg was a good control to show Roger what happened in the absence of a seabird restoration project. And as we approached the south end of the island, we could see the nesting gulls and cormorants. The island looked just as I remembered it 20 years ago. Just gulls and cormorants, no puffins, no terns. Mike was filming Roger while Judy asked questions about his memories of the place in the 1930s. I was doing my best to position the boat so the island and birds made a backdrop behind Roger while keeping an eye on the waves, which had kicked up a bit. When they completed filming, we circled to the north end of the island. Would you like to make another pass around the island, I asked. The filming resumed as we began our second pass, close along the eastern shore, where dozens of eiders were bobbing in the surf under a large granite knob. Then I brought the Lunda a second time around the south end, keeping her several hundred yards offshore, away from the rollers that were now pounding the shore. We were in about 30 feet of water. Mike and Judy continued to film and record. Judy with microphone in hand and Mike with his huge camera on his shoulder, powered by the lead battery belt he wore to his waist. I was the first to see the wave coming. A huge wall of green water was rushing at us. I shouted, here comes a big one. <laughs> In that blurry instant, I was looking up at an angry crest just before it curled down and crashed into the Linda with such force that the port side of the boat where Michael was standing was pushed down, flipping the Linda completely over. I recall thinking, this can't be happening. This has never happened before, but it was happening, and we were all thrown into the frigid water with all our equipment sinking and floating around us. Somehow my binoculars remained around my neck. But Mike went straight to the bottom, weighed down by his lead battery belt. Tangled in cables and still clutching his camera, he probably would not have made it back to the surface without Judy diving down to free him of the weight. The $50,000 camera was ruined. Miraculously, we were all near the boat and keep our heads above water, terrified as more waves rolled over us, getting weaker by the instant as the 50 degree water sapped our energy. At first, we couldn't find Roger, but much to our relief, he soon bobbed to the surface near the capsized boat. We mustered our strength to pull ourselves up onto the slick belly of the Lunda. Together, we hauled Roger out of the foaming water onto the boat. But before we could reach, catch our breath, another great wave broke over us, washing us back into the frigid water. Now we were drifting closer to western Egg Rock. I was afraid the boat might crush us against the granite, so we began swimming as best we could to land. Eventually, we started finding welcome rock beneath our feet as we neared the shore. Now this goes on, and Roger did not die, neither did anybody else. Fortunately, the world's most famous birder would not have been a good thing on my resume. <laughs> you should buy the book and finish that chapter. <laughs> And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with that thought that there's a lot more behind this story. That's why I read that. Project Puffin is a lot more than graphs on a number. It's about people that care. It's about taking risks. It's about being out in the weather. And it's about making a difference. Thank you very much. The question is, we, will, will we find a way to keep the puffins there without the interns being there. I used to hope for that. That was the idea of the turns. Um, but I don't see it now, because we not only have the gall, resurgence of the gall, but we now we have the bald eagles as well. And we also have a lot of tourists during the summer that, that if they land on the island, they're not going to be doing the, the colony any good either. So, no, I don't, I don't see it, but I don't see that as a problem either. And I think it's, um, and, and while I used to believe 
that uh, we would be able to walk away from that rock. I, I think that we can't see eastern egg rock as separate from the waters around it and the coast around it, all of which is so dominated by people. So we can't restore one piece of nature without restoring the whole thing, and I don't see a time when all the people will be gone and the whole ecosystem will be back. So the alternative is to not have these species there or to, or to maintain these colonies. Sustainability really comes down, if we want to use that word, and I'm not sure it's really always appropriate, but in this case, sustaining keeping. If sustaining means keeping the puffins interns on the island, it means keeping the interns on the island and finding a way to support this project to keep it there. It costs money, and it comes down to that. Um, Derek, do you want to add anything to that question? No, you got it. Okay. <laughs> all right. But thank you for asking that question, because it's one of the big take-home questions from this. Not all projects do we need to keep people on the islands. The, um, the project with the common emerge pointed out how we, we did the restoration, and we backed away. But in China, will they be able to leave those those turns there? No. There's going to be somebody come along for eggs. But it's not a bad thing that some part of our population be the stewards. That was the message I learned as a kid. Some percentage of our population needs to be the caretakers of this planet. And who are they? They're the young people. That's what this is about. Think of that group out there as a, as a school. They're, they're having an education. And they are the future caretakers. We need more of them. So the question is, when we see um, the food is too big, can we, <coughs> could we supplement? Um, well, we probably could, um, and we might save a few chicks. But what the chicks are getting on the island is probably what they're going to get when they get in the water, too. And so if it's a year where there's a lot of butterfish around, that's what they're going to find when they get in the water. So I don't think supple and most of the chicks are deep under rocks, so we wouldn't be able to get food to them. So we maybe save a few chicks, but we wouldn't save the population. And I think it really um, the, the point is that we need to make sure there's enough fish in the sea for the puffins. We need to m and do whatever we can to to reduce the, the rapid effects of climate change that are causing these kinds of changes, and also to protect the fish stocks so that we don't overfish and we don't take them all out with, with, with the very efficient fisheries around now that, you know, the fish don't have much of a chance. They can be chased and there's not many left for the seabirds. So regulations and policy protecting the fish, forage fish, is a big part of the answer to that dilemma. Will the colony grow to the point that there'll be enough puffins so that the predation won't be a factor? Um, I'd like to think so, but these are relatively small colonies. That's what I'm saying. And, and, and the larger colonies have that protection. Um, the larger colonies, like the, the big ones in, in Iceland, don't have the same kinds of problems. But they have different problems. The puffins in southern Iceland, for example, uh, haven't bred in the last 10 years because their food supplies have moved too far from the islands. And the parents aren't even, in some cases, laying eggs and not hatching chicks. So there's different problems in different places. So and I think that that speaks to the need to protect the entire range. The fact that puffins are thriving in Maine is a good thing because they may not be thriving in Iceland the way things are going. It's hard to look into the future, but a, but a large, more intact range is always a healthier thing. Multiple breeding places. The question is, how could you go to see puffins? Uh, well, the easiest way to see puffins is to go to, to one of the puffin watching trips off to go out to Eastern Egg Rock. Okay. There's a trip that goes out every day from late June through the first week of August out of New Harbor. I recommend that trip. It's a nice trip. And, and our Audubon interns are on board giving the narration. And the company gives some of the money back to Project Puffin. So is there a particular company that... Uh, that's, that's Hardy Boat Cruises. And the fish, uh, John, or Fish and Sons out of Booth Bay also does a similar. Can just add one, one thing that actually relates to your question and up there about um, can they ever get to a population. Um, there's another island farther down east called Machaya Seal Island, of which uh, you can actually uh, take a boat um, if you get a reservation early in the summer. You can actually land on the island and get in a bird blind for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. 
And that island is fascinating because on that island there's 6,000 puffins, 3,000 pair. Um, but in recent years, um, they've lost their cover of terns. And uh, they suspect uh, one of Steve's colleagues, a fellow named Tony Diamond from University of New Brunswick, suspects that the terns at some point lost their food supply and uh, then uh, the gulls came and uh, they just couldn't, re the terns couldn't reestablish themselves. Now, for some reason, the, the puffins are still numerous enough that they seem to be holding on, but it's uncertain in future years without the turn cover, will the puffins uh, continue to exist in the numbers that they have. So um, uh, you can see them there, but again, even on an island, the island closest to uh, Steve's project, where puffins number in the thousands, there are still um, a lot of uncertainties. Um, yes, Adopt a Puffin is, is one of our uh, fundraisers, and um, people that want to do that and give a puffin as a gift to someone, they get a certificate with the recipient's name on it, and they get a picture of the puffin, and they don't even have to feed it. <laughs> they don't, and, and the, but the puffin doesn't write to you to, uh, <laughs> it's sort of like a college student going off to college. Yeah, that's, that's a helpful thing. And of course, I mean, a project like this uh, receives most of its, its support uh, from private donations. The adoption is $100, but of course, gifts in any amount are, are helpful. Um, and I think that, you know, and that's part of our goal is to build up the number of people supporting this work annually that we can keep the interns out there and the infrastructure it takes to keep, to keep them there. All the way in the back. Uh, so I've got a mechanics question. Um, I don't understand how the puffin can get half a dozen to a dozen fish in its bill. <laughs> All at once. I'm surprised it's taken this long to get that question. Uh, it's a great question, and it's and the puffin is unusual in, in its ability to do that. Uh, the pictures you saw in Maine, our puffins are pretty modest about this. I mean, a dozen fish is a pretty big load, but in and uh, in Scotland, someone once cat netted a puffin and it dropped 61 fish. So think wow. about that. The, the, the basic idea, I think, is the puffin chasing these schools of fish underwater is snapping them up uh, one or more at a time uh, by lowering its, dropping its lower uh, mandible down and using its tongue to press the first part of the catch up against the roof of the of the palate, which has spines that point backwards, gives it some grip. So you got a relatively flat tongue pushing uh, fish and holding them there while the tongue, while the lower mandible drops down and snags other fish, which then definitely slips the tongue under and adds that to the first part of the catch. Uh, that's the theory. Whether that's what the puffin does or not is another story. <laughs> Probably as good as any answer. <laughs> So the interns, um, they, they come from all over the country. Uh, fortunately, there's plenty of interns for our project. We hire about 20 every year. Um, they are college majors in, in biology, uh, generally uh, juniors or seniors. There, there's a, there's a, uh, a few schools um, that support this by actually sponsoring an intern. Uh, and others, uh, we raise uh, funds to, to bring in. In addition to uh, the U.S. Uh, interns, we have some international students. Uh, the two young Chinese biologists I showed in the picture are actually going to spend their summer with us in Maine learning more about seabird conservation and management. Uh, they're coming all from China and then they're going to go back and, and ban uh, hopefully Chinese crested terns at the end of the summer. We have two interns from Baja, Mexico coming up this year and, and one from uh, Chile all uh, professionals in seabird conservation from other countries. So uh, we can't hire them all. There's several hundred people actually apply for these positions. Yes? Well, I just wanted to add that it sounds like a great thing for uh, your next book. Uh, it would be a great photo, photo journalism study. It's a great idea, but you don't have to wait for the next book because the last chapter actually uh, has a lot about that. 
And um, there's some great pictures in it, but thanks. And, and following up with, with the successes of these, these students, and some of them are now, you know, well established in the field. They are, they are running whole, whole aquariums and zoos and they're professors at universities. It's really a privilege to know that we helped inspire them for these, these lifelong careers. The question is, um, is there anything else that can be done to um, reduce the, the gull population? <coughs> I think that if, if the waste that fishermen were throwing overboard was recycled into some sort of a useful product, it would be a win-win for everybody. The, the lobstermen would make more money rather than just throwing this, this whole bait overboard. And that's happening a little bit, uh, composting into garden supplements and, and things. Um, so far, that really hasn't made a big enough difference. Ironically, in some places, the gulf populations are now declining. We have closed a lot of the accessible land dumps, uh, but there's still plenty of garbage uh, for bird. But they're declining because of the growth of the eagles. The eagles are eating them. They are recycling the gulfs in their own eagle-like way. And the eagles are a problem. And the eagles are a problem because one eagle, um, none of the birds will land on an island when there's an eagle sitting on it. And here's a question right here in the front. An interesting question. Uh, why does the puffin lay its eggs in a burrow? It's suggested that for a long time, puffins and gulls have coexisted. And the puffin has found a way to avoid gull predation by going underground. And so it's, been, it's become an underground bird um, to the point where it lays white eggs, that it was a typical of a, of a, of a cavity nester. And the chicks. Um, even though they're daytime animals as adults, they are they leave at night. So they have the behavior to leave at night. Why do they leave at night? That's when gulls are usually sleeping. So I think bird nesting and nocturnal departure <coughs> are because of the uh, presence of gulls, a long history of living and adapting to gulls. Thank you all very much. After this course, about 75% of the students said that they were interested in, in engineering. So it was a strong indication to us that this biomimicry-oriented approach to teaching something like engineering um, was really reaching the students.